Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. to Cambridge and he's now at the computer lab um, right here. Uh, today he tell us about his work on home networking that he did while at Rocky. OT. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you for having me back, I should say, I guess. <coughs> um, so, yeah, so I've just started the computer lab. I've moved down from the University of Nottingham. Um, the work I'm describing here was carried out while I was at the University of Nottingham. So it was an episode project involving uh, <coughs> Nottingham and some of the collaborators, including Tim. <coughs> uh, so the talk's going to be about the experiences we had during that project, some of the things we did, and then uh, how that's leading into what I'm expecting is the things I'm going to be investigating for the next couple of years at least. So it was sort of my current agenda, I guess you'd say. The basic question that started off with this project, was it was about home networking. So what it turned into was how to redesign infrastructures to be accessible and manageable by non-expert users. And it was focused particularly on, the, on Wi-Fi networking in the home, or networking generally in the home. I found it an interesting uh, project to join, join when I arrived at Nottingham. So it had already started about, about 10 months, 11 months, I think, before I joined Nottingham. Because it was mixing um, very human-centric techniques, like ethno ethnography and so on, with actually trying to build uh, technologies, build home routers technologies, deploy them, and get them to work uh, in real life. Um, it, as it says there, it was a three-year project. It was funded by the EPSRC and RCUK. Uh, it was universities of Nottingham, Glasgow, and Imperial College. And then BT and Microsoft Research were the uh, industrial partners in it. And we also collaborated a bit with Georgia Tech through this. So they're, they're kind of co-conspirators in this. <coughs> the motivation for the project was really the observation that domestic networking is a problem. So I will do the traditional thing now. Hands up who's got a Wi-Fi network or other network technology at home. Hands up who's really happy with it and finds it utterly satisfactory in every respect. Uh, hands up who has to go and help uh, I don't know, parents, siblings, children, manage their networks at home. Yeah, you see, it's kind of the traditional sort of proportions there. Um, so the argument we'd make, I think, is one of the reasons that these technologies are difficult for people to deploy and use in domestic contexts is that most of the technologies involved have been appropriated from other contexts. So they've been taken from managed networks, typically, whether those are broadband, uh, whether those are ISP networks or whether they're corporate networks, where you've got experts, and you've got experts engaged in the process of managing them and making them work efficiently and effectively. Um, so people know what they're doing. They know what everything means. They know how to interpret stuff. <coughs> and we've taken all these things and just dropped them in the home and expected people to kind of catch up. And this has forced people in the home, forced at least usually somebody, some individual in the home, to have to become some kind of net admin or system administrator. And this is not something that most people want to do, uh, I think it's fair to say. So the kind of the, the sort of the way we approach this was how can we how can we try and make some of these technologies a bit more intelligible to people? Um, so this was a, um, a learning experience for me, learning the difference between the word intelligible and intelligent. So the aim here is not to try and make home networking automatic and automated, so you never have to do anything to it, because the chances are you can't do that. You can't do that successfully, and when you try and do it, it's going to work some of the time, and that'll be great. Then it's going to fail, and that'll be disastrous because you won't have a clue what's happening. Right, you won't have a clue how to fix it or how to engage with it. If you can make it intelligible, if you can turn it into something that people can engage with and they can fix and they can understand to, to the extent they need to, then you can make something that's a lot easier for people to manage in their particular context, in their particular home, in their particular lives, um, and, and take into account all of the different differences around the way it's used. So the aim here is not to automate everything. It's to make it possible for people to use it effectively and to manage it themselves. <coughs> the sort of context we were dealing with. So this is the sort of vision people have of <coughs> the future, or at least it was a vision some people had of the future. Um, who has got children here? Anybody with children recognise that sort of picture? Is your house ever that tidy? Um, so this, the, a lot of these visions, were, I think, were not fully informed by reality. Um, this was the kind of thing in some of the ethnographic studies that were done that you see when you go and take photos of people's home networks and home computing environments. Obviously, a little bit dated now. Um, who has CRTs anymore? <coughs> but they're quite messy, quite complicated, 
bits of trading cables, things plugged in, other things plugged into other things, plants sitting on top of things. It's, um, <coughs> this is not a corporate managed environment, right? This is not a data center. Um, this is certainly not a data center. And these are the kind of things that we found in the houses that were went to be investigated, right? People are taping bits of cable to the stairs and so on to try and get connectivity into different bits of the house. Um, there were, to the extent that there are companies, or at least there are um, journeymen, uh, joiners, who will come and make you cabinets and install your gear in the cabinets and clip it all up and make it tidy and give it doors so you can shut it away so it doesn't look like a big mess in the lounge, <coughs> uh, as an example being here. So there's, there's a lot of... Um, there's a big difference there, I think, between the vision people have of the way things are going to be and how things actually get deployed and used and managed. And part of this is about taking that into account and trying to think more about what actually happens. <coughs> Same kind of things apply in people's heads to some extent. So conceptions of the network. This was a diagram drawn by, uh, for the Ward Family House. I don't know if you can read a bit in the corner. The Ward Family House networking diagram. It was entered in the Cisco competition. It won an award for best home network. Uh, as you can see, <laughs> this is quite a, um, this is a substantial home network. Uh, there are uh, mixers, network storage, jet printers. There's a Catalyst 2924 switch in there. This is, I think, not your average home network. <coughs> there was a project done, I think actually strictly outside homework, certainly before I joined the project, where the aim was to try and get people to sketch their home networks. So these were a couple of the sketches that came up with that people came up with when they were trying to sketch their own home networks. So in the top left there, you've got the more technical of the two uh, the partners involved in this. And it's pretty hard to read now. But you've got some basic idea of what's going on there. So there's the internet, there's SBC provide the cable connection, um, there's DSL modem, there's a print server, there's a hub and a router, um, there's a printer attached by wires to the print server, you've got some Wi-Fi wi connectivity. So there's, there's an understanding of the devices in the network and how they're, how they're attached and how they're managed. The less technical of the partners um, had a picture of the house on two floors. Uh, there is a front door, there's a table with a laptop on, um, and then there is a bed with a laptop on as well. Uh, if you could read some of those words, you would see things like crazy energy waves that communicate with other computers and I think maybe eat our frontal lobes. It's one of the comments made. And crazy waves that fight with our neighbors, crazy waves. So there's a, there's a bit of understanding of interference there, and this can be a problem. That other home networks around in the area may provide a problem. Uh, but as you can see, it's a lot less of a technical conception of what's going on. <coughs> There's a big mismatch here. And these are the tools that people mostly build to manage networks. And they're not really going to fit with the kind of conception on the previous slide. Right? Um, the idea of understanding timelines and graphs and pie charts, and well, not that we like pie charts, topology, topology diagrams and so on. These are, it's going to be difficult, I think, for people to match up with their experience of what's going on. So you end up with... Uh, I don't know what some of those things are. I'm sure people in the audience do know what some of these more complex Wi-Fi um, parameters are, but I certainly don't. Um, and really, giving people these sort of tools to manage these things is not, it's not helpful. Right? <coughs> that was the <laughs> amusing visual joke there. Um, so what went on in the project? There, were, there was basically ethnographic studies of about 24 homes in total. This is over... I think more than the strict lifetime of the three years of the homework project, um, it, they started doing some of the ethnographic studies prior to this. Um, so 24 homes uh, in the UK and in France, I believe. Um, variety of ways of engaging with that. So technology tools, getting people to talk through what they've got, semi-structured interviews, getting people to describe, give stories, basically anecdotes about problems they'd had, issues they'd, that had occurred. And the point of all this was to get an understanding of the problems people faced in real life. It's not gathering statistically significant data. It's trying to get some of the richness and some of the complexity of all this out in the open so we can start to think about what we could do as a response to it. Um, so it's, we're looking at how people use their home networks and how people manage their home networks. <coughs> the kind of the headline figures from all this. So home networks are very heterogeneous. They're very fluid and they're very mundane. So it's a heterogeneous collection of devices. Five to 15 devices per home in the homes that we looked at. At the time, the UK average was reported as being just under five. So that's kind of, it feels like the right sort of number. Quite a lot of different devices. So PCs, laptops, mobiles, but also games consoles, media streaming devices, cameras, radios. And the number of things here is only increasing over time. The number of types of things is increasing, and the number of things is increasing. And, you know, Internet of Things revolution taking off and all that. Device ownership and access rights were very fluid. So 
there's relatively few devices in the home where only a single person ever uses it. Um, possibly your phone, perhaps. You're less likely to lend that to other people, maybe. But in most places, you know, tablets would get shared around. So I know in our house, the kids like using the tablets to play games on. Um, and occasionally I have to dive in and stop the three-year-old buying things on iTunes because he's managed to get out of the, the, the interface from the game that he's playing. Um, <coughs> so it's very fluid. Things are getting passed around and shared. It's hard to be able to say, this device should be managed like this because it's always used by the father in the house or it's always used by the, one of the kids in the house. And digital housework has become this unremarkable feature. So somebody in the house will be responsible for managing the network. Right? They'll, 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 that'll be just something they do from time to time. They'll, then they'll be used to it. So people come round, they'll be the person who gets, finds the Wi-Fi password and gets people connected if you want to do that. Um, <coughs> so it's quite a... Um, it's become a normal, a normal feature. And this sort of happened over the lifetime of the project. As, as I said, this was over a three-year funded project, about five years of work in total. And over that time, Wi-Fi really did become just default standard assumption it would be there. <coughs> Out of all this data, there were sort of four key challenges that we kind of extracted from an understanding of what people were doing. And challenges to the infrastructure that's being provided. So the first one's consumption. So it's how, how do we control and understand the bandwidth of use of the network? This was something people wanted to be able to do. Um, the sort of quotes that we got from some of the interviews. Uh, I want to see an accumulative historical record of bandwidth use. So the current month, week, day, so I can see patterns of use over time. In this particular case, this household, they had an international student who came to stay with them. And that student was doing a lot of video watching from sites that were based in the Far East. And this was blowing through the bandwidth cap that BT applied to this household. And so they wanted to get some visibility into that. So they could then go to the student and say, look, it is you that's causing this. Could you, you know, bung an extra tenner in a month to cover the, ex the increase in the bandwidth that we need? The second one <coughs> is, sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm going to be coughing a lot. The second one is monitoring performance and understanding activity. So there was a sort of an ongoing need to, when something starts happening, you want to get some visibility into that. So in this case, the quotes are saying, you know, you occasionally say, is somebody torrenting? Right? It's affecting streaming video or whatever it is. Somebody must be doing something. What's going on at the moment? Who do we have to go and tell to stop it? Right? Who do we have to go and tell to do that later on in the evening? The third one is about prioritization. So there were several, at least a couple of households where one of the parents might, for example, work from home. And so they had the strong view that if they were working from home, they did not feel that they should ever be interfered with because the kids had decided to start uploading YouTube videos or whatever it was. They wanted to be able to get on with their work and not be affected in any way. Um, so there was a need to prioritize, a need to make those decisions um, dynamically during the day. You, it wasn't enough to say, now, between 9 and 5, this is going to be the policy. That, that could be a bit too static. You want to be able to make these decisions on an ongoing basis. <coughs> and then finally, there was policing. Um, so this was quite a common theme. Children on Facebook when they should be revising, for example, and parents desire to stop them going on Facebook when they should be revising, or at least have some way of negotiating, controlling that kind of behavior. In this particular case, it got to the extent that one of the mothers, I think it was, bought a 3G dongle for her son, so that when he went and visited a friend's house, she didn't have to ask for the Wi-Fi password at the friend's house because she knew that his, her son's friend's father worked from home and so she didn't want um, her son's activity on their network to interfere with his working from home. So it was easier just to buy him a 3G dongle and then it didn't matter. When he went and visited, he couldn't possibly interfere with, with the use of the home network. <coughs> so these were the challenges. Consumption, monitoring, prioritization, policing. So what we tried to do to see, to investigate how we could address these, um, we focused the attention on the home router because this is a single point of control, <coughs> single point of access in the house. Um, it means we don't have to go and start fiddling about with the 15 different types of client there are out there and trying to understand how they work and misconfigure them and break people's experiences. Um, so the idea was we'd build a home router, drop a home router in as a replacement in the house, essentially set up the existing home router as, just as a modem, and then deploy it, deploy a bunch of interfaces to it and see how people used it, see what people did with it. So we built a platform, some might say this is slightly over-engineered, um, using OpenFlow uh, to provide a DHCP server, DNS interception, and a control API. Um, part of this was an excuse to fiddle with OpenFlow. Part of it was because a lot of the existing Linux APIs, this was based on the Linux platform, are not particularly good for doing this kind of interception. I, th I find them difficult to deal with, um, so I thought I'd try something different. 
So in the home router that we had, the, basically the, the three technology chunks that were in there, we had a bunch of stuff in there to do monitoring. Um, so the homework database and the USB device monitor, I'll come to in a bit. So that was where the basic kind of statistics gathering on the traffic, the monitoring of traffic took place. And it presented that information in a way that we could write apps that would use the data that was being made available, being observed through the home router. Um, there were, was a control interface. So as I said, this provided a DHCP server, a custom DHCP server, provided DNS interception, and it provided a RESTful API so that we could write apps to use on devices in the network to interact with and, ma and control the router. And uh, then we had traffic forwarding was the standard kind of Linux bridging and open vSwitch code. So there was nothing particularly interesting in that. <coughs> and subsequently, I had an intern come in and replace the homework database, which was, uh, it was a streaming database that was developed by Joe Sventek and folk at Glasgow, um, which was quite interesting in that you could download kind of automata into it that would do um, computation on the raw stats that were coming out of the basic monitoring devices there. Um, to produce other kinds of statistics, other kinds of data you might want. But all of the UIs that we actually built to interact with this thing just used the basic flow table. Uh, there was an Ethernet table with RSSI stats in it, and there was a DHCP table to tell you who'd connected, which devices connected and got which addresses. And it turns out all of those could be replaced by just using the OpenFlow statistics messages that were available through the OpenFlow switch anyway. <coughs> we built this thing. Um, went through three iterations in total. Um, we started deploying it from iteration one. Um, they were deployed for four to six months, usually in the household, so it was quite longitudinal deployments. Um, one of the reasons for that, because in some sense it just makes your life harder, right? You've got to manage this thing and people, you've got people living with a device you've built that's going to potentially break their home network and when it does, they get really cross. So having it, making it reliable and well-engineered enough to work for four to six months at a time um, did make life more difficult. The problem was if you don't do that, you get these kind of you get these novelty effects. So a home network displays, traffic displays, allowing people to see what was going on had this novelty effect. Everybody was very interested to start with. Um, within a couple of weeks, they'd had enough of looking at it and they'd put it in a drawer and not bother anymore. So they'd cease to engage with it. So you get this kind of burst of interaction at the start where people get interested, and then once they've got some idea of what's going on, they put it away and ignore it. And so we needed to leave things deployed sufficiently long that they would actually encounter problems or they would have a need to go and interact with it again. So something would come up. Otherwise, we weren't really getting any real kind of interaction with it. It was interesting that surfacing traffic usage, uh, the phrase there was introduces domestic discord. So the network is a, it's a piece of infrastructure used in the home and it's intertwined with the, the moral ordering in the home. So when you start showing people how the network's being used, this is not a completely neutral, neutral activity. So having um, you know, spouses get cross because they could see that the other spouse had gone to the loo but was actually using the network, for example, because right, they wanted to check their email and it wasn't appropriate to check their email at the table, that sort of behavior, right, where you, you start to see what people are doing by showing them what the network's doing. And this becomes difficult, can become difficult, doesn't always become difficult, it can do. And it sort of leads this idea that managing the network is part of managing the household, so it's just part of what happens. Um, People want to see what's going on. They want to get involved in this to some extent because it is part of their everyday lives. It's part of what they're using. Um, but it can be quite difficult to allow them to interact with it because things like privacy and history. So the router is collecting all this data. It's collecting data about who's doing what, when they're doing it, which devices are doing it. Um, one of the types of activity that was observed was that parents might want to go and say to the children, show me your browser history. Right, I want to see what you've been doing. You told me you weren't going to go and do that. I want to see what you've been doing. Well, that's kind of okay, because you can do that. You can go and ask the person and talk to them and get permission to do that and see it and you know, have a discussion about it. When it's being collected in the background and you can just go and look at it without having to ask permission, that changes the, the relationship, changes the interaction there. And in fact, um, at one point, it's arguable that it also uh, violates their human rights, so, um, because got, everybody has a right to privacy, even as a child. I believe. <coughs> so it was quite, it was, it's sort of doing this fairly, what you might think of as fairly boring deployment of just a home router actually started to surface quite a lot of different uh, problems in this space. <coughs> so I'll talk a bit now about interaction with the infrastructure. So the things that we built, the UIs that we built to allow people to do different things on this network, to try, uh, try and address those four challenges that came out of observing what people were doing. 
Um, so they are listed there, and I'll go through them in turn. So legibility. So this was about, in fact, I'll summarize them first. So legibility was allowing people to measure and interrogate what was going on. So letting them see what was happening. Um, and in a way that they could make some kind of sense of. Um, putting people in the protocol was allowing people to interact as part of the existing protocol. So this particularly happened with DHCP. So it was, a, it was changing the way, that this is why we had a custom DHCP server. There were two reasons for that. One was we wanted to change the way people interacted with it. So rather than having to pre-configure and set up in advance, these are the devices and these are the addresses they're going to get, we want to allow people to, to stop and think at the, at the point where somebody's trying to get on the network, get an address, are we going to allow this to happen or not? And DHCP was the easiest place we could do that. Um, the other reason for wanting a custom server there is we wanted to deal with the problem that too much gets shortcut at the Ethernet layer and you can't, because of the way the monitoring infrastructure worked, we couldn't see all the traffic necessarily. Um, so by handing out a separate subnet to every device that connected, we could force everything to be IP routed to make sure we saw all of the traffic. Getting services close to users allowed greater control and configuration over how those services were deployed and used. This was DNS in particular. So what names are going to be resolvable, what sites are going to be, are you going to be allowed to connect to. We did some work looking at the physical, ex how to exploit the physical arrangement of the home. So this is something that, for example, wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be reasonable to do in a large corporate network. Right? It doesn't make any sense. But in the home, you can do things with the physical arrangement where you can say, well, if you're inside the house, if you're inside the front door, and you've got physical access to the router, if you're doing bad things, I've got bigger problems um, than my home network. So we will use that physical action, a physical interaction, as a way of allowing you to control the network. Um, we provided a policy, network policy definition interface, which somewhat to my surprise people actually used and did define some network policies that they deployed in their home networks and actually made use of. Um, and again, it was about simplifying the interaction to the point where it was something that was relevant to what the people, want, the people involved wanted to do. And then finally, we looked at how to try and fix device association, Wi-Fi association, because that was one of the big pain points that came up in all the observations we made, that getting devices on the network, particularly devices like, uh, well, the classic Internet of Things, example of a fridge, but games consoles, um, things that you don't have keyboards on, essentially. Typing in long passphrases and things like this is awkward on those devices. So we tried to do something that would, that would fix that. <coughs> so, sorry, I'm going to keep doing that. Um, so the legibility. We looked at uh, fairly simplistic things, just showing which are the active devices and which are the active protocols. So we used the homework database, time series database, captures this traffic information in real time. Um, can capture user interactions, user actions at the same, alongside network traffic. And then there was a simple notification service that would allow people to be notified when certain things happened. Um, we built this, we deployed this. It was useful. Um, in the case, for example, of the student, the foreign student who was watching videos um, from the Far East, it allowed the, I think it was the mother in the household, to see what was happening and go, be able to go and have that discussion with them about what was going on. So that worked quite successfully. That was something that people found useful. Um, even though it's pretty simple and it seems quite sort of naive. The presentation, though, is better perhaps than showing the standard sort of engineering view where you've got lots of wiggly timelines or you've got pie charts and the other. That's sort of too engineering focused. This is something people could look at and go, oh, these are the top three devices at the moment. What's that doing? That shouldn't be there. I'll go and talk to them. As part of the interaction uh, on this in this interface, we also guaranteed that you got some metadata about the devices when they connected to the network, so you knew whose the device was, for example. So this was the control panel interface. This was about getting, allowing people to connect and control connection to the network. So the DHCP server, essentially, when it got to the point of receiving the request, instead of just saying yes or no, would fire off a, a notification to this. This was an HTML5 interface. Fire off a notification, which would pop up something um, in the central column saying this device is requesting permission. If you want to allow it to connect, then drag it over to the internet column and you'll be prompted to fill out some metadata about it. If you don't want to allow it to connect, drag it over to the left-hand column. So again, very simplistic kind of interaction. But it allowed people to exercise the sort of control they wanted. <coughs> it allowed people to deny devices access to the network after they'd been permitted. <coughs> so when you have you know, kids get their friends around, they all get connected so they can have what I think used to be called a LAN party um, and play games on various computers. Um, you can then drag them back off the network when they go. Right? You don't have to leave everything configured for them. The other thing that was interesting with this is that the left-hand column would show devices that were not allowed, and this would include devices that weren't actually trying to get access to, but were simply visible because of the Wi-Fi broadcasts going on. 
And a lot of people were very surprised and quite interested to see just how many Wi-Fi devices there were around them. Um, one household in particular that was near the top of a hill with a bus stop outside would get you know, 300 devices going past with every bus. Right? And they were sort of surprised to see how much activity there is around this. So it was kind of surfacing this quite invisible piece of infrastructure, which pe some people found quite interesting. Um, I found it quite interesting when we went to SIGCOM with this as a demo and realized there were about 3,000 devices that were going to be displayed in that column, um, which meant that that had to be fixed. Um, <coughs> it wasn't, the UI was not designed to display 3,000 things in that column. Um, it did not perform very well when it tried to. The third thing I talked about was the idea of bringing services close to users, so trying to get things nearer to the context they're being used in rather than leaving them to be set up in this very generic fashion. So this was locally determined name resolution, so users could police internet access by setting up rules that would control what names could be resolved and therefore what IP addresses could be connected to. <coughs> this one wasn't deployed for any length of time, um, but it sort of showed some of the things. With it, we could kind of demonstrate some of the things you could do. If you, if you start to think about customizing how these, as I said, normally generic services run and operated by ISPs are operated, if you can get them customized to the use that's being made of them by the individuals. Um, I think you could use this as, a, as an example looking at the kind of uh, the stuff that David Cameron set up with the sort of the um, porn filtering and so on, where that's a very generic decision that's being made for the entire country, essentially, by a small set of ISPs. And it's inevitably going to make false positives. So I think there have been cases there where, for example, um, sexual health advice websites get captured by that sort of filter. And being able to control that on a bit more of a dynamic basis with more input from the people it's actually affecting might be a useful feature to provide. <coughs> physical nature of the, of the home. So physical devices give you this ability to provide a kind of ambient awareness. So you can drop a, a thing down on a coffee table. Um, that was the, the lit up thing on the top right there was an example of a thing that was constructed to do this. Uh, the LEDs light up um, according to uh, various measurements being made on the network. So I think the green ones were signal strength, Wi-Fi signal strength at that place in the house. Um, there were also uh, flashes that would, blue flashes, I think, that would come up when devices were allowed to connect to the network, and red flashes when devices were denied access. And this was sort of interesting that you could set it down, and it would give you an idea of what was going on without being too intrusive. So you weren't having to consciously monitor and manage the network, it just gave you a general idea of what was happening. The other thing we built was the idea that, using the idea that people are used to physical access control. So they're used to the idea that you have a key, and you can lock something, and then you unlock it with a key, and you get access to it. So uh, we used the USB monitoring uh, system in Linux so that you could take a key with some metadata in the file system, um, plug that into the router, and that would affect network policy, essentially. So it would permit access to a particular device. Um, and this was the sort of way that we felt we could implement policies that a couple of the households wanted, which were things like, you only get to go on Facebook after you've done your homework. That's quite a hard thing to encode in traditional network policy rules. Um, but if you can do something which says you don't get access to Facebook until one of the parents plugs in this key to the router and only they have that particular key and nobody else has that key and that allows you to get access to it. You can begin to make this quite interactive and quite dynamic and quite context sensitive how people are going to control their network. <coughs> this was the policy interface we provided. So this was the comic strip, sequential art. Um, policy interface. So it was how do you set up the router so you can help people control the network pros prospectively. So they make some decisions in advance about what they want to happen in certain circumstances. Um, by setting it up as a comic strip interface, it kind of made it possible for, for normal people to engage with this and to think about what they wanted to have happen and express that. So the way this, this interface works, three panels at the top. On the top left, you've got um, subject being defined. So you could basically tap that and it would flip through the people in the household and it would flip through their machines in the household, their devices. Um, you've then got the middle panel sets a condition. Um, the one being shown there is activity between two times, activity within a time range. But you could also set access to particular websites or you could set um, bandwidth consumption, I think was the third one. So when a particular device uses the network between particular times, then the final uh, panel says the action that's going to take place. So you could, you could either block devices from the network, you could, I think you could rate limit devices, and there's one that I'm going to forget. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to forget it. Um, but you, essentially, you could, you could exercise fairly simplistic, um, but quite, potentially quite intrusive 
control of the network. So you could actually block someone's device from the network completely as a result of action taken by a completely different device, for example. And then the panels on the bottom were just sort of to illustrate what was going to happen. So that they, you didn't interact with those particularly, you didn't actively do things with them. Um, this was sort of interesting because two of the households did deploy this. And they deployed what we thought was going to be the nuclear option, which was they actually, they, what they essentially said, the policies they deployed were um, if, I think in at least one case, it was the daughter's laptop accesses Facebook, then block it from the network. And they didn't even go for the notify option. It was just, it's off, right? It's off the network now. Um, <coughs> and that was kind of interesting because we hadn't thought that would get used because it did feel like too stringent a, a punishment almost. It was like this, this was going to be difficult if that happened. Um, a notification, surely. Oh, that, was the, that, in fact, that was the third action, was notification. So we could cause the system to send you a, either a tweet or a text message or a <coughs> push notification. A variety of sorts of notification could be given to say such and such has just happened. Um, but they actually chose to block it, for example. They, they booted it off the network completely. But it turned out that that wasn't the end of the matter. It, well, this wasn't, again, it's not like a corporate network situation where that happens and that's really bad and then what do you do next? What, it happened, what happened as a result of that was it triggered the child involved to go and talk to their parents and say, I don't know what happened there, really sorry. Um, can I get back on the network? And there was, apparently there was then a discussion about how important homework was and you know, not spend too much time on Facebook. But it was just part of the ongoing, this, is this thing of, um, it's just about managing the household. Managing the network is managing the household. It was just part of that ongoing discussion about appropriate behavior. I think the issue here is that you, you, you're doing a study on something which is so fast moving. What you say three years ago is true. Today they'll just say, oh, sod it, I just use my phone. So you, you're providing the parents a false view that they have stopped them using Facebook. In fact, all they're going to do is use Facebook through a different medium. So the, what, the, the router is no longer the gatekeeper to the internet. That's... And, and to, to, to give that impression is to give a false impression. So these deployments were a few years ago. Um, so at the time, I don't think it was a false impression. And what I'd say now is that it's, this is, I, what I'll come to towards the end is I think this is an example of where we should think more about infrastructure technologies and the uses people make of them. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say you go and do exactly this now. Although I think with the phone example, there will be other means that you have of trying to manage that. So the use, the amount of money your children are spending on that, for example, depending on the age they're at, is something you may give them more or less control over. I mean, it might get to the point where you've got a 16-year-old at home, and if they want to go and use Facebook and not do their homework, you're not going to stop them doing that by any reasonable means. Right? It's about them starting to take responsibility for their own actions and what's going to happen as a result of that. So it, there's, a, it's kind of, it's, there's a spectrum here. And this was something that was, that was interesting to deploy at the time and worked for what it was at the time. But yeah, I wouldn't try and do this now and say, this is going to stop children accessing Facebook, and that's the only way to do it. But on the other hand, you know, if they've got limited bandwidth on their phone, if they're trying to do lots of video things on Facebook, maybe that's something that's not going to work so well for them, and they would prefer to do it on the Wi-Fi. So it's, you know, again, it's not about stopping them, and that's the end of the matter. It's potentially about either inconveniencing them or causing them to think about what they're doing or not do it by accident or whatever. So there's a, there's a much richer set of things around it than simply saying, this is a policy and you will not do this. <coughs> Does that make any sense? It does. That's, just, that's what I mean in the sense is that the, the things are moving so fast. That, and, and these studies are very difficult because of this, this thing of actually sort of saying is that what was a policy is now a false uh, belief to some extent, simply because there are so many routes around a lot of these things and there are so many different ways of accessing it. And it is a, and, and also the fact is a lot of the examples you've given were due to limitation. I mean, like three, four years ago, you know, just getting a, uh, a printer on Wi-Fi was a nightmare. Whereas I've got an old house, so you have all these issues. Whereas, you know, again, I mean, BT Hub is so much better than um, things used to be. So, so a lot of these limitations on on bandwidth, they're going away very quickly, and it is. It's very difficult to do these types of studies when you've got this sort of massively changing technology. So having Area. just moved into a new rental house and deployed BC network service for the first time, I would disagree that all those problems are going away. Um, I did not find it a, a good device to try and interact with setting things up. 
Um, and for example, setting the parental control stuff on that, um, which was done initially, and suddenly discovering that uh, one of my laptops no longer worked because when you set the parental control system up, uh, you can no longer do DNS resolution through anything other than BT's DNS servers. And I happened to have one that was set up to resolve through Google's public server. Um, some of these things, some things get easier, but it, it's not at all clear to me that they've been fixed and things now work. Um, no, I don't think they're fixed, but it is the problems change quickly. Uh, I think, yeah, I think the way that the problems surface themselves changes quickly. Um, I think the claim I'm going to make towards the end is that some of these things can be addressed at a deeper level that will hopefully fix them for longer. Any other questions about? <coughs> the final one was the Wi-Fi Association. Um, this was a project carried out by a PhD student of mine called Anthony, Anthony Brown, um, who I believe is currently due to submit his thesis on Friday, but we'll see. Um, so the idea here is, the, the problem here is how do you get devices associated with a Wi-Fi network? And it can be really awkward, particularly for devices where you've got to interact with you know, co games consoles and stuff where you've got kind of 1D inputs and it's, it's difficult to type in a big pass, passphrase. The way all those systems currently work, um, and it, this includes things like WPS and push button and so on, is you're getting credentials from the router into the device. Um, so you've pre-configured the router, that's got the SSID set up, that's got a passphrase set up, and you need to get that information into the device. And all the devices have different ways of doing this, and it's a pain. So we kind of figured, okay, well, we could turn this problem around. If we pre-configure the devices, and we envisage this might be done at manufacture time, with unique cryptographically generated passphrases and SSIDs, then all we've got to do is get that information from the device into the router. And then the router can do something in response to that. In particular, it can spin up a virtual access point with those credentials, and then the device will automatically connect to it. So that was kind of what we did. Um, so we observed that, again, physical security in the home, this is not something that's going to be deployed out in the wide world necessarily. It's going to be inside a house where it's maybe difficult to get access to these things. Pre-configure all the devices with SSID and passphrase, and code that as a QR code. Stick that to the outside of the device, maybe on the bottom of the device if you're really concerned about security. And then when you want to connect it to the network, take a smartphone or something else with a camera, scan the QR code, it conveys those details to the router, router spins up a virtual access point, device connects to the virtual access point. Um, and this seemed a more straightforward mechanism that could be deployed more universally than all the different ways that you might go about configuring devices now. <coughs> so we built this and we ran a, this was a lab test rather than the, in the wild deployment, but we asked people to construct a network using the classic printer, but also a squeeze box radio and a laptop running Windows 7. Um, and we were comparing WPS Direct, specifically push button WPS, WPS Direct, and Multinet, which was this system that we built. Uh, ran a user study, 16 participants, uh, 10 male, 6 female. 10 of those people were the home network administrator for their household. 12 of them had never used WPS before, and 6 had never seen QR codes before. <coughs> this was only about 18 months, 2 years ago. Um, home network sizes, devices, size in terms of devices ranged from 3 to about 15. And the mean there was slightly above what the UK average was at the time, but it was it, all in the right sort of numbers. Um, one of the things we had to do to run this study was to rewrite the instructions for at least the printer in particular, um, because it was, I, I exaggerate but only slightly, you had to go like 17 layers deep in some configuration menu to get to the point where you could push the button for the WPS Direct to work, because it was a software button. It wasn't a physical hardware button on the outside. Um, so, yeah, that took some time. The data we collected from that lab study showed that, hopefully unsurprisingly, um, certainly we were pleased, uh, Multinet seemed to work more efficiently. So people could get things configured and on the network in less time using our system than using WPS Direct. Uh, the other thing that was sort of interesting from this is the use of instructions went down over time. So with WPS Direct, because a lot of these buttons that you have to push to do this are actually software buttons, you have to go and read the instructions to find out where in the system you get to, you have to get to to push the button in order to start that process off. Um, the thing with the Multinet system is it's the same for every device. Find the QR code, scan the QR code, device connects to the network. So we found quite rapidly, after doing this a couple of times, people stopped needing to read the instructions. 
Um, whereas with the WPS Direct thing, basically people continue to have to read the instructions, um, unless I think in the case of two users, they knew how Windows 7 worked and could just get it on the network anyway. Um, so that seemed to improve things. So I think before I go to the next bit, are there any other questions about homework side of things and the home networking stuff? Nope. Okay. Uh, so that was, you have a second QR code, special QR code on the bottom of the router. And the software, the app you download and install on the device um, uses that QR code, and the router trusts that QR code more. So that's, the, that's kind of the blessing of the device. So how do you get the app on? You get the app by installing that from an app store. So how do you get to the app store? Oh, how do you get it? So that's, why the, sorry, that's why there's two QR codes on the bottom of the router. So one is the QR code that links to the app in the app store. The other is the QR code with the special credentials for the router. So you can go to any kind of barcode scanning app that you happen to have on your device, which most people did. Um, scan the first one. Gets, that gets your smartphone, for example, to go to the App Store, download the app. App gets installed. Once the app's installed, you then scan the other QR code on the bottom of the router. And that's got the special credentials for becoming a blessed device that can configure the router. And then you've got a blessed device, which you can now go and scan other devices' QR codes and get them onto the router. So the, that was the bootstrap process. So for that device, you've got to scan two things and install an app. So if you're assuming a smartphone, why not just use the NFC between the smartphone and the best dish to just tap it? Uh, you could do that if you could tap the device and then go and tap the router, for example. So you can get the smartphone connected to the router by doing that, um, but you, we, you want some mechanism of getting other things connected to the router. And some people put their routers in the loft. Uh, for example, which makes it less accessible. And some devices are fridges, mm -hmm. which are too big to go and tap. Um, so yeah, it, the, I think the, the interesting thing to my mind about the way this worked was it was about getting credentials from the device to the router. And really the QR code and the camera mechanism was, it was the easiest way to prototype it. But there are, there are other things you could do, I think, to do that. <coughs> Anything else? There's a QR code for Wi-Fi passwords. That yep. people use. I mean, for the, like the Xbox now, you could actually just take. You know, I've printed out a QR code at home with my Wi-Fi name and password on it, so that any visitors can actually just come up to it and snap if they want to. Yeah. You could show that to the Xbox or whatever, and it will take yeah, that as Wi-Fi um, password. Yeah. So for some devices, this is done. I think BT used that system for a while for their home hub as well, so that you could take any device and go and scan it. But they seem to have stopped doing that now. At least last time I looked. So I don't know why. So that was the experience of the, in the homework project. So it was a set of deployments we did of different things to do with infrastructure, different ways of getting people to interact with infrastructure. And the interest I found in that was that the idea of trying to build user-centered infrastructure, so taking things that you traditionally think of as very stable and hidden and shared. So this was a photo I took of the pavement when there was some digging works going on, showing some of the different infrastructure that's underneath the pavement. You don't think about it, so it doesn't get fiddled around with very often. And trying to look at the differences of that sort of infrastructure to computer networking infrastructure, which as homework seemed to show, is quite a lot more dynamic and fluid and complicated and messy, and tends to be more customized to the particular context it's deployed in. <laughs> so my claim for this, and this is what hopefully will be my agenda, and I will do interesting research and it'll be really good, um, is that homework demonstrates the way we build these kind of technologies at the moment doesn't really work terribly well. You, kind of, you sort of incrementally make them better and better, but they're still fundamentally difficult for people to come to terms with and use effectively. Um, and I think that there's, there's scope for work to be done where you think differently about how you design these technologies. If they're going to be deployed into contexts where non-expert users are going to have to manage them in particular, then you think about putting people at the center of this process to begin with and think about what information will they need to be able to see in order to be able to make sense of this and use it without having to become expert in its management and use. Um, and this sort of started, I guess, because I was in a very good HCI group at Nottingham um, as the systems guy in the HCI group. And hopefully here, um, I'm going to be the HCI guy in the systems group, and this will be an interesting flip. Um, but it does require this mixture of approaches, a mixture of techniques, because there's different sorts of data to collect, different sorts of data to analyze, and yet you still need to do the engineering and do the deployments and prototype things and get them out there to get people using them. <coughs> the kind of the big umbrella under which I'm fitting this is it's about getting people interacting with data. It's about human data interaction, not human computer interaction. There's lots of systems, 
I'm sure you can think of many, where data is being collected about you. Data is being collected about your house, your household, your, I don't know, not long now, driving usage, you know, driving patterns, et cetera, and probably already. Um, and there's very little visibility into these processes, very little understanding of them, and understanding of how to control them and how to interact with them. And so the claim we're sort of making is that when we're building these large data processing infrastructures, which are going to affect and observe and manage the way lots and lots of people, normal people are behaving and normal people are interacting with the world, um, there are some things that should be borne in mind when you do that. And these things, we think, the way we've termed this, are legibility. So the ability to see and understand what's happening and what data is being collected about you and how it's being used. The ability to have agency in these systems, so have some capacity to act. You may not choose to act, it may be something you don't care about, but some people may choose to, and you need to have that capacity built in so that you can engage with stuff. And negotiability, so the ability to change your mind, to come in and out of these systems, to make decisions and then change them at a later date. <coughs> the couple of things that I'm trying to spin up immediately as different things to build here is the idea that I think it would be interesting to enable people to operate their own infrastructure. So rather than just saying, hey, Microsoft, Google, you run it all for me. I trust you. I trust you with everything forever. Um, try and build systems that will allow people to run some of their own infrastructure, so to deploy their own systems and think about what are the hard things about doing that and how can those things be addressed. So the particular thing, technology I'm trying to apply there, is the Mirage technology from Cambridge. Um, has, who's heard of Mirage? I know Anil's given at least one talk here. Um, it's the idea there that because everything's much more tightly encapsulated and bound up than it might be traditionally, um, much more in a sort of app store type model almost, where you've got a thing you download and you run and that's it. You don't go and do lots of other things to it. You don't have config files sitting in slash Etsy or Windows System 32 or whatever to control things. You don't have the registry to fill around with lots of interactions. You've got single unikernels that have everything bound up, all the configuration, all the code, all the state. Um, it might be possible to use those to give you a more sort of app store model for deploying things like a personal DNS server or a personal web server. <coughs> we'll see. Um, the other, well, one of the other strands here is about making infrastructure more legible. So one of the things that we sort of observed with the homework project, again, was that uh, the vocabulary was all wrong. So thinking of people, people don't think about using the network per se, or certainly by the end of the project, it wasn't, I'm going to go and use the network. It was, I'm going to go and do the shopping. And the, the network was incidental to this. It just happened to be that was how it was being used. And yet, none of the monitoring stuff that goes on, none of the monitoring capabilities you've got in a network, certainly in a home network, allow you to see that shopping is being done. They allow you to see that some data is being transferred between this device and that IP address. And if you're very lucky, you might have a DNS name associated with it. But that's really about all you get with that. Right? You don't get to see this is shopping happening, this is banking happening. These are the di different activities. And so there's, no, there's a big mismatch between the terminologies and the vocabularies that you can use at these different layers. If you want to allow people to manage their own infrastructure, it needs to be in the terms that they want to manage it. <coughs> so the interest, the interest I have here is how can you make the infrastructure more legible? How can you make it make sense to people by thinking of it in terms that they, they use. So there's an EU project uh, that's ongoing where we're starting to do this by, initially we're doing some deployments of some interfaces which will allow people to annotate their network usage with what they were doing at the time. So we can get the kind of the vocabulary out of them that they use to think about these things. And then the aim is to apply magic machine learning techniques to attempt to learn what the activities are that are taking place from a human point of view when you observe certain sets of things on the network. Uh, this is some very initial attempts at doing this. Um, and it kind of shows that, uh, I think here, user four is sort of being detected more reliably than the other three users for the user four traffic. So it was sort of working okay there. And I think user one wasn't doing too badly. Turns out in this case, users two and three were never detected reliably at all. They were absolutely terrible. So uh, it's a complex problem. We're working on it. But there was some hope. I think the initial results seem to suggest that there's some hope you might be able to do something there, that people's behaviours are potentially detectable from the network activity. And that's it. Any other questions? No. Uh, yes. Just to figure out, do you see it in the... <coughs> 
sorry, in the home network uh, experience, uh, did you see any case in which the children outsmart the parents? Uh, for instance, like, you know, you, do, you cannot use Facebook, but I can use a proxy, so that basically I can bypass the policy, or I can, I don't know, disconnect the router and use my, you know, my friend's router, I mean, these kind of things. I'm not aware of any that got reported. Okay. But then they wouldn't okay, be. Okay, I'll you probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> There were, I think, yeah, I'm not aware of anything that got reported. It wouldn't surprise me if some of that had happened. Um, on the other hand, there is, it, they're not actually malicious actors, right? Having that sort of security model view on this is probably not the right way to think about it. No, no, I, right. I understand there's your point a, about you know, bringing the discussion there on, but I was just yeah. curious. You know, there's, there's a, but but it, even, I think even from the child's point of view, it's not necessarily the case that they're just out to get everything they possibly can. There is a, they're in a social environment that... You know, there are things they're expected to do and not expected to do, and they kind of know that, and they, they work with that. Um, so I think it is, it is sort of dangerous to start thinking about this in terms of uh, malicious actors, for example, in a system. It's not the right model to have um, for it. This is a terrific talk. I think it's, it's amazing stuff. You talk about um, trying to increase agency for... for People's one of your three things: that, um, legibility, agency, and whatever the third one. Negotiation. Um, <coughs> one of the interesting things you talked about was, you know, <clears throat> making networks intelligible rather than intelligent, so that people could, as it were, ask the right questions of it when things go wrong. Could you talk more about those aspects, like trying to? So, because even even when you you know show them, you've got you've got systems whereby they can easily drag things left or right to allow or disallow. Presume at some point they still had trouble with that. Were they better able to, to formulate questions to then ask for help? Uh, that wasn't something we looked at explicitly. So we didn't, unfortunately, collect data on it. One of the things here was that the, the way that the studies were done is we didn't have somebody living with them for the four to six months, so we wouldn't necessarily see those things. So it was about what they talked through um, when they were interviewed, I think, on a weekly basis, essentially. Do you think they were better able to formulate problems that, that, were, that were sort of uh, then understood by... I would expect that they would have had more understanding of some of the things that were happening. So things like just having more, have, just having a better conception of the fact that there are lots of devices out there around in the in the space around you. Um, having an understanding of being able to look at something and go, oh, that device is really busy, or that protocol is really active. Just you sort of get more of a sort of background understanding of what's going on. But I wouldn't be able to say that they'd actually been able to diagnose something better or give a better fault report or anything. You don't think they'd be able to do that? Um, I, I can't say either way. I don't have any data. Is, but that, is that of interest to you to, to see if people are able to do that better? Yeah. So, you know, so that, for example, when they call the helpline, their version of what's going on is, is you know, more, more understandable by those who are trying to deal with the problem. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that is certainly of interest. I think that was, I think, one of Microsoft's interests in why they were involved in the project. Um, the, there, were, there are two things I could say to that. One is, so one of the features that we often talked about building, I think did actually build, but couldn't get uh, a deployment scenario where it made sense to test it, was the idea that you could have a button on the router that would allow you to hit the button, and that would take a snapshot of everything that happened for the past 30 minutes. And then you could send that as a part of the fault report, essentially. Um, there was quite an interesting paper at WMUST 11, I think it was from AT&T, where they deployed a similar kind of thing with, on their cell phone network. So you, the idea was you have an app, I think it was, on the cell phone. So when you start experiencing call problems, traditionally, um, if you want to report a fault to their network, you have to phone them up. And so if you've got a call problem on your cell phone, you can't phone them up. And so you have to wait till you get home and phone them up later. And you can't do it outside business hours. And so they weren't getting enough information. But by having an app on the phone that you could just hit a button on, um, it could send the report either then or later if it had to. And they found they actually got, a th I think it was 30 minute um, <laughs> advance warning before their fault detection system discovered a fault in their cell network, because people were starting to experience problems and they were getting this early notification effect. Um, so I think there's, there's sort of, there is interesting things around that. Um, the other thing was there was a PhD student um, who's still at Nottingham who was looking at, the idea was to try and build a time traveling router. So a router that would snapshot enough of its state and understand enough of the snapshotting of its state that you could go back in time. Because one of the problems is people, something goes wrong on the network, something stops working well. And it could be your router, it could be the internet. And they go and fiddle, and they fiddle with the configurations and do something to it. And then it works a bit, and then it stops working a bit later, and they fiddle again, and the thing just gets completely mashed. 
Um, and so the, being able to have some system that would allow them to go back in time and say, well, it certainly was working correctly two weeks ago. I'll go back there and have that kind of flexibility was another thing we felt might help people to do that sort of management and that, that fixing faults, potentially. Same as bigger again. 